Fire Pit Creative Group presents Aftermath, Episode 12, By the River's Dark. General Castro, Major McGillicuddy, and Dr. Bath commandeered the Liberty Island Ferry. With Cuddy's aid, the General steered the boat away from New Jersey towards Manhattan. Halfway through their journey, the explorers spotted mutated men, known as Rockheads, brandishing torches and weapons gathered along the shore of Ellis Island. Rifle fire rang out from the shoreline, slugs pelted wood and fiberglass, windows cracked. Unable to defend themselves, Dr. Bath recommended abandoning the ferry and leveraging the advantages of their robot bodies. Without the demand for oxygen, they could dive overboard into the murky waters where the upper bay met the East River. General Castro joined Major Cuddy and Dr. Bath on the top level of the ferry. Bath jumped first, but Castro had to push the Major. The General watched his fellow explorers descend into the black pool, disappearing underwater. Then, as he was about to jump, Castro turned and saw a smaller boat coming up behind them, gaining on them quickly. Determined to ensure Bath and Cuddy's safety, he returned below deck and fixed the ferry's throttle, forcing its course for the rocky coast of another island. As bullets pierced the ferry, Castro turned. With his robotic eyes, he focused, peering at the boat gaining on them. It was filled with rockheads waving torches. Some were jumping in the water, swimming to board the ferry. Castro hesitated, but only for a moment. Thankful his robot body reacted more swiftly than his aged, disabled human body in the porcelainization chamber in the underground Phoenix Project. As mutants boarded the ferry, the shoreline came up quickly. Castro leapt higher and farther than he ever had, crashing into a damp mass of jagged rocks. There, the general watched the ferry collide with the island. Wood, fiberglass, and plastic shredded like paper. The second story of the ferry collapsed on the mutants. The Phoenix Project's laboratory was not quiet by any stretch of the imagination. Donna Chang was well acquainted with the lull of microservers, the soft vibration of metal inside coated polystyrene cables crisscrossing overhead. She faintly heard the turning of the magnetron. The sound of industry and electronics always comforted her. General Castro, Major McGillicuddy, and Dr. Bath's bodies lay in the porcelainization coffins on the other side of the room. Chang's laboratory partner, Chief Surgeon Meryl Ganaya, was either asleep in the residence or working her other job in the hospital many floors above. Chang swept away a moderate accumulation of dust from the rear corner of the laboratory. She lay on a cold mattress. It had been her father's bed up until his death a few years earlier. Like Donna, he had been an engineer. Chang Wok Yi was a nuclear physicist permanently stationed at the United Nations. He was a political asset for the People's Republic, but not an ambassador or government official. Donna's father worked with China's allies and his Western counterparts to produce research on shared programs. He was making a presentation to the United Nations Security Council when he and his much younger mistress, Donna's mother, were evacuated along with other members of the Phoenix Project. Yi made a career in the Phoenix Project as a programmer and instructor of mathematics. Donna's mother accepted work as a nursemaid to the children of professors. They built a family with Donna and made a life for themselves underground complying with the edicts of the Shadow Council and the Central Processor. Known as Chalky by his co-workers, Donna's father wasn't permitted to operate on the Central Processor, but he and his fellow programmers were the ones who built the laboratory. They resurrected technology and storage and implemented the power supplies to give it life. As Donna grew up, her parents spoke little of their lives before the attack on New York City. They treated their existence above ground as a past life. Donna was never satisfied by a lack of detail about their history or information about her father's work. She pressed him for wisdom, explanation. My job. Chang Wok Yi once confessed, in an uncharacteristic display of emotion, was to make sure they had no clue what was coming, or who was responsible. 
Donna watched the old man speak these words as if defeated. She was too young to understand what he meant or why he spent little time with their family. On his deathbed, Chalky called his grown daughter to his bedside. He was too feeble to wipe tears from her eyes, but tried anyway. Why? Chang asked her father in an accusatory tone. Why was your work so much more important than us? The old man produced a small aluminum box filled with hard-bound red notebooks. Scrawled in a mix of Chinese letters and mathematical codes were her father's notes on how to operate the machines in the laboratory. Someday, Donna's father insisted, you will understand. From those coded manuals, Chucky poured out his knowledge into his daughter. Yi knew Donna's unique knowledge of the machines and systems in the laboratory would make her the perfect candidate to serve as chief engineer for the research mission to the surface. Since her father's death, Donna came to realize he was a major source of disinformation, espionage. Chang Waki's role as deceiver was hard for his mature daughter to reconcile with the fact that he was the most intelligent, disciplined man she ever knew, a man who suppressed the past and looked to the future. There were days like this one, lying on her father's old mattress, that Donna struggled with her role in the Phoenix Project. She hid mixed emotions behind a mask of seriousness. But she missed her father and wondered what her life would be like if the exploration of the surface was a success. Would she be true to the Phoenix Project and its citizens? Or would she remain loyal to a country, a culture, a way of life she never knew? Somewhere under the mouth of the East River, Cuddy and Bath stood in a sealed maintenance silo connected to what was once the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. They were led there by a ragged, middle-aged man and his son, Kick. Between them lay Sally, a woman the man described as a sex monkey or prostitute. Bath examined the woman who was obviously in the throes of malnutrition and disease. Without antibiotics and a better source of food than the mutated rat the boy skinned and cooked, she was sure to die. If we can trouble you for a weapon, maybe a map of the area, and point us in the right direction, we'll take the cans into the city to parlay for medicine, Cuddy offered. That way, you can watch her, and we'll take the risk. You've been straight with us. We're here to help. The middle-aged man cocked his head to the side, as if preparing himself for bad news. You guys ain't Chinese, are you? The survivor asked Cuddy and Bath. People said it was a Chinese started the war. What war? Bath casually took a step forward so he was between the boy and his rifle. Cuddy shook his head. No, we're not Chinese. Like I said, we're going to help you get medicine for Sally. Their host looked back at Sally lying on the maintenance room floor, her skin pallid, perspiring. It was evident their affection was neither physical or intellectual. It was a kind of love neither Cuddy nor Bath could readily understand. I appreciate this, Cuddy, the man said. You're the first folk we met ain't tried to kill us or steal our stuff. Whatever you can do. Cuddy and Bath sat with the grubbers in a semicircle bathed in flickering candlelight. The boy spoke a prayer, words he clearly knew by heart, imbuing them with a poetry Bath thought was both beautiful and naive. Having studied spiritualism but believing in no deity, the professor watched, wondering, were they just words? Concerned only for their survival, the man and his son ate heartily of the mutated rat. Each time the boy chewed a piece of the pink, rodent muscle, Bath was glad he couldn't smell flesh or blood. Occasionally, Cuddy glanced over, his glare implying the professor's stare was insulting to their hosts. Bath couldn't help but wonder if this was what civilization was reduced to. Was this worth fighting for? Their host produced a sawed-off shotgun and a bag of shells. Cuddy had never used a weapon of this kind, but said nothing. The man described the weapon's modifications and the contents of the shell. It's a mix of powder, shot, and steel, the man explained. Don't pull the trigger on anything you don't want to put down, Kick added. Sometimes it's just best to run. While the man searched for his maps and paper, Kick turned to Dr. Bath. You want to see something? he asked. You're a doctor, ain't you? You can read. Bath nodded slowly. The boy peeled back a crimson curtain, revealing a makeshift closet. There, stacked floor to ceiling against the damp rock wall, were cardboard and cloth-bound books. 
stitched relics the likes of which the professor had never touched, never held in his hands. Where did you find these? John asked, his eyes wide. Found them in cars, mostly, the boy replied. Some in buildings we looted. The Bible? Well, we took it from a traveler laid dead in the morgue. Bath's robotic eyes and fingers floated over tattered copies of popular paperbacks from a century earlier. Novels romanticizing murder, sexuality, and betrayal. Part of Churchill's history of the English-speaking people. William Kaufman's translation of Friedrich Nietzsche. A wrinkled journal on zoology. We can't read them, Kick said, and there's no demand for them. You can't read them, Bath paused. But you kept them? Kick nodded. That's right. You can have them if you want. No use keeping them. For a fleeting moment, John wanted to offer to teach the boy to read. It seemed as noble and important a thing as helping the world-weary grubbers trade stale food for outdated medicine. Instead, Bath flashed a grin, thanking the boy. The doctor held the books, felt their texture, considered the choices of print on gray and yellowed pages. He wanted them, wanted to keep them to somehow steal them away back to the laboratory, to the Phoenix Project. Here we go. Their host produced a crumpled old blueprint. He scrawled on the unwritten side, hand drawing a path from the underground tunnel to lower Manhattan. From there, he said to Cuddy, you have to watch out for Silvio Jones's people. They control all the barges along the waterfront there. Who? Bass said, glancing over his shoulder. He's a gangster, Kick explained. Controls all the exterior transportation from the Brooklyn Bridge across the water to Staten Island. That's where the mud slugs and sludge snakes live. Their host nodded. That's right. And Silvio's like their godfather. The worst of them all. Mud slugs? Bath spoke quietly. Cuddy shot Bath a look. The doctor returned to the bookshelves. He flipped through each mangled book at increased speed, robotic eyes moving swiftly from paragraph to paragraph page to page. The process was joyous, but overwhelming. The middle-aged grubber drew a few landmarks on the map, none of which Cuddy knew. Still, he carefully watched the other man and listened to descriptions of hazards, cluttered roadways. Some areas were policed by those who consider themselves de facto law enforcement. Others were ravaged by subcultures like the Morlocks and Rockheads, outlaws who fought each other for territory. Some things never change, Cuddy said. Best to stay below ground if you can, their host indicated. That way, all you have to contend with is the Morlocks. They can be right hospitable if you've got something they want. Finished with a shelf of books, Bath turned to Cuddy. We need to get going. But we'll be back, Cuddy said, nodding at the man and his son. Thank you. The father shook Cuddy's hand. General Castro fled from where he scuttled the ferry. He climbed over a steep incline of rocks, more of a barricade than a natural breaker. Every few feet, he glanced behind him, hoping the scavengers, the rockheads, weren't in pursuit. Castro stood at the edge of the rock face. The general's synthetic eyes compensated for the lack of light in the clearing. He knew he needed to keep moving, to find shelter. Somewhere his simulacrum wouldn't be vulnerable when his consciousness was ripped through the green stream, back to the Phoenix Project laboratory. The general walked through an abandoned marina. Wood and fiberglass skiffs were moored haphazardly nearby. Then the general heard footsteps. Who's there? He called out cautiously. A figure cloaked in rags emerged from the shadows. Hello, you there, came a childlike voice. Hunched over, the stranger was easily six feet tall. Hello, are you... Castro stepped back on his heels. That's far enough. You got weapons? Asked the man, who moved quickly in place, side to side, backwards and forwards. Don't see no weapons. I'm armed, Castro lied. He inched forward. Robotic eyes focused on a rash of scaling skin coiling from the nape of the man's neck up the side of his face. What the hell are you? Name's Piker, the man replied. Piker, I'm Jen... My name's Castro. How many people are on this island? Piker hesitated as if taken aback, unsure. This island? He inched forward. I said stay where you are. 
Castro raised one fist, concealing the other in his coveralls. Piker giggled. <laughs> I'm not armed. Might say, Piker's a bit disarmed. He pushed away the cloth around his neck, revealing full-sized hands waving from his arm sockets. Yeah, I can see that now. Castro groaned. He had seen deformities caused by war before, but this was something different. Like the primal rockheads he, Cuddy, and Bath encountered on Liberty Island, this piker was something else. A mutation. How many people? Castro said, walking closer. I'm thinking, said Piker. Do you mean survivors, or... What else is there? the general asked, confused. Well, there's only a few originals left, said Piker. The rest of us are their loyal subjects. Subjects? Castro gazed at the pink and gray scales hanging from Piker's collar and neck. The abnormal rash wrapped around the man's misshapen head. One clear blue eye flared brighter, bolder than the other, which seemed depressed in its socket. How did you get here? Castro asked. My mummy was in Bellevue, Piker replied. After the fall, she was moved here to Nut Island. Something about this made the mutant laugh uncontrollably. <laughs> Lark that is, eh? Nut Island, where they relocated the nuts. Get it? Satisfied Piker was no threat to him, Castro circled the other man. It's not very funny. Anyways, Piker continued, waving his wing-like hands for effect. Mummy was batty, thrown a lot of us in here with all the other nutters. It is said, nutters breeds nutters. Castro nodded. If he understood Piker correctly, the mutant's mother was a mentally ill survivor of the destruction of New York. She gave birth to the young man. Something about her condition caused his mutation. So, this place... Castro said, glancing around. He glimpsed short buildings in the distance. You're saying everyone here is Looney Tunes, Piker interrupted with glee. Castro sighed, unamused. Don't believe me? Piker leapt in the air. Does the Castro want to see for himself? See the lovely filth in the gilded magistrate's house? The magistrate, Castro asked. Who's that? Is he your leader? Piker nodded. The magistrate is our father, our caretaker. His wife is our queen, La Signa Belle. Castro looked at the ground, then out at the dark water in the distance. He needed to find a safe shelter for his simulacrum. He was running out of time. Okay, Piker, Castro pointed. You walk over there. Take me to this magistrate. And don't try anything, or... Piker can't try anything, he directed the general's gaze skyward. The crows are circling, see? The ramparts must be manned, lest the rockheads and the Morlocks come steal our stuff. Piker protects our stuff. Yes, he does. Castro looked up, but saw no crows. Fine, he relented. Which way? Laughing, Piker skipped several yards in front of Castro. Follow Piker, who never lies. With little choice, Castro followed Piker, unsure of where he was being led or what he would find. The general hoped the magistrate the disabled man described was a survivor of the attack on New York City, someone who could provide insight, answers about the past, obstacles faced in the present. Dr. Miro Ganaya shook Donna Chang's forearm, rousing the engineer from her slumber. Donna opened her eyes to see the Iranian woman standing over her. Chang, Miro spoke softly. Cuddy and Bath have stabilized. Everything appears to be okay. The general, however. What is it? Chang leapt to her feet. She led the way to the biological readouts and computer consoles at the center of the room. Castro's vitals were inconsistent. Ganaya stood a few feet away, studying the green and yellow screen that displayed a digital image of the general's body. As you know, she continued, while the mind is in the green stream, it interprets what is happening with the body. It must be cold on the surface. Chang nodded in agreement. We they were surrounded by water. He may have... Behind Ganaya and Chang, the laboratory doors slid open. Project Administrator Danielle Devenu crossed the room to where the specialists performed their duties. Good evening, Danielle. Ganaya greeted the other woman without turning. Everything all right? Devenu asked. So far, Chang replied. They are more than halfway through the cycle. Good. Monitor them closely. 
Danielle sounded exhausted, her words forced. I wanted you both to know... There have been rumors that the dissidents are causing trouble again. The laboratory was identified as a target. What? Ganaya turned swiftly. Why? Isn't it obvious? Chang said, her attention remaining fixed on her console. If they can control this technology... Devenu nodded. Neither of you have spoken with anyone about our work here, have you? Anyone outside the team? Ganaya shook her head. Of course not. Maybe Bath has. Cheng shrugged in the direction of the porcelainization coffins. Perhaps, Devenu said, pacing a few steps. I'll address that with the council. When Dr. John Bath was assigned to join the research team exploring the surface, it was evident his personality might clash with the others. There were suspicions that while the professor was not formally associated with the dissident population of the Phoenix Project, his views made him susceptible to their efforts to recruit. Bath had friends well acquainted with suspected dissidents. General Castro and Devenu had to convince Major McGillicuddy the professor was essential. Later, when Bath's robot body suffered damage at the hands of survivors on the surface, Ganaya had to transmit Chang's consciousness into a spare simulacrum to effect repairs. As a result, Bath was temporarily grounded. Chang found the experience transformative, convincing her that she was better suited to the assignment than John. I'm reaching out to Phoenix Law Enforcement, Devenu continued. I'm asking that they post security around us. Ganaya crossed her arms. Won't that just raise more attention to our work? <sighs> Probably. Danielle pursed her lips. It's for your safety. Don't leave the laboratory until our team returns. When the project administrator turned to leave, something caught her eye. She walked to an old chalkboard standing behind the porcelainization coffins. A blend of characters, symbols, and code were scribbled on the board. Excuse me, Donna? What's this? Donna Chang looked over, wincing a moment. She couldn't remember scrawling the information on the board, but knew exactly what it was. It's just something I was working on, she replied. A schematic of the simulacrum. No point in building something without a working schematic. Danielle and Meryl peered at the engineer intently. How did you do this? Ganaya asked. You... you did this from memory? From your brief time in the simulacrum? I, I don't know how to explain it. Yet, Chang said, standing. When my mind was connected to the green stream and I poured it into the workshop under Liberty Island, I linked to the computer. I could see... this. What do you mean? Devenu asked. Chang's eyes narrowed and a line formed between them. It was like, for that brief period of time, I was part of the computer. I was one with it. There was a glint in the engineer's otherwise black eyes. When I was ripped back, back here, Chang pointed at the chalkboard. That was left in my consciousness, imprinted on my memory. I could see it clearly, how the simulacrum, the robot bodies, how they work. Ganaya studied the schematic. She didn't understand the technical writing. She wouldn't even attempt to translate the foreign characters. But she made out interconnected circuits, machines that took the place of organs, the most important of which was the brain. You gonna try to build one? Meryl asked. No, not quite. Donna smiled at the thought. It's incomplete. But if we can better understand how the simulacra work, there's no limit to what we can... Meryl shook her head, interrupting. You did all this in 12 hours based on memories from your brief time in the green stream? I did. Chang nodded proudly. Donna, Devenu said, we all appreciate your efforts, but this is what I'm talking about. This is exactly the kind of thing the dissidents would want to steal. Don't lecture me, Danielle. Chang turned back to her computer console. Those fools would need a codex to understand it. The project administrator crossed the lab back to where the engineer sat nonchalantly. You didn't ask the Shadow Council for permission. Devenu raised her voice. You didn't ask me. Chang glanced up at the younger woman. Why? So I could wait indefinitely for them to consult the central processor? Danielle glared at Donna. She knew Chang was right, but resisted saying so. 
Unable to respond to the engineer, Danielle stormed out of the laboratory. Donna felt Meryl's plaintive look. What? Something happened to you in the green stream, Ganaya said. It changed you. Not immediately, Chang said. She turned from one computer monitor to another and flicked a switch. She continued. After I last went to sleep, I had this dream. A vision. Of this. You expect me to believe you saw all of this in a dream? Meryl leaned against the computer console, demanding the engineer's attention. You don't know what you're dealing with, Donna. The general was right. We don't know who built the underground laboratory on Liberty Island, or the simulacra. It could have been created by an enemy government. Chang interrupted. The irony isn't lost on me, Meryl. Believe me. She spoke coolly, as always. But it would be foolish of me to chastise you about the fact that, on the surface, your native country and the generals were lifelong enemies. Ganaya recoiled slightly. What does that have to do with anything? Donna continued. Industrial interests aside, the Chinese and the West had their differences for years. If we weren't fighting for the survival of the Phoenix Project, I'm not so sure Danielle, John, and Cuddy would be my allies. Meryl's expression turned from concern to fear. What? She leaned closer to Donna. Now you're suggesting we're born into destructive nationalism? That's absurd. I didn't say that, Chang replied without flinching. Ganaya stood straight. She walked a few feet away from the engineer's workstation. She checked the vital readouts for Major McGillicuddy and Dr. Bath. Listen, Meryl implored, her tone softening as she spoke. You should let me run some tests. Observe you for... No, the engineer rejected her co-worker. Look. Meryl leaned against one of the porcelainization coffins. Despite her knowledge of how the transference chambers and systems worked, Ganaya hesitated to admit she was terrified of the prospect of channeling her mind into a mechanized body. She wondered why Chang was so eager to do so. I know you're ambitious, Donna. I know you want what the rest of us want, but... And what is that? Donna looked at Meryl sideways. We want to restore life on the surface, Ganaya replied, to create a better world for the children of the project. But listen to me. We have to be patient, and we have to be smart. You and I both knew going into this assignment that it may not be us, our generation that goes back. We always knew this could take... It could take decades. Chang paused, leaning back in her chair. Finally, she turned to Ganaya. <sighs> we don't have years, Meryl. You've spent too much time in your hospital dealing with the fools that come and go, putting stitches on self-inflicted wounds. Maybe that's fair, but Chang waved a hand, silencing Ganaya. If we are to defeat the dissidents, we must control how we return to the surface. We have to follow the central processor's plan and get there first despite what the Council says. Ganaya's expression showed her confusion. I don't understand. Oh, Meryl, Chang said condescendingly, clasping her hands together. This mission is just pretext. Don't you get it? This technology was left on the surface for a reason. Probably more laboratories spread around the planet with a specific purpose. The engineers and computer specialists of the Phoenix Project, men like my father, were futurists. They brought the coffins, this equipment down here, because they knew eventually things would break down. Eventually we would run out of food, supplies, medicine. Living underground would lead to conflict. Whoever created this technology, east or west, it doesn't matter. They never intended for us to recreate the world as it was. They intended for us to create something else. Mira watched Donna turn back to her console. Sometimes it seemed the only thing that gave the engineer any comfort was her work. Ganaya stared at the zigzagging lines and encoded symbols on the chalkboard across the room. She worried about her friend, and wondered if Chang's experience in the green stream could alter her mind, her spirit. What was it doing to General Castro, Major McGillicuddy, and Dr. Bath? General Castro cautiously followed behind the tall but slouching piker. The disabled young man ambled up the winding road where white pavement cracked in disrepair. Once elegantly landscaped grass and shrubs now overtook the walkway leading to wrought iron gates. 
There stood the small church, where Piker assured Castro he could meet the magistrate. Before they could cross the threshold of the gates, two men approached from the left and right. Each wore something resembling makeshift armor, weather-worn and rusted metal at the shoulders. Bound cushions padded their torsos. "'Who goes?' asked one of the men, brandishing a gnarled spear. "'Tis I, Piker,' spoke the general's guide. "'The fool,' said one of the sentries. "'And who does the knave bring to his holiness's home?' asked the first guard. Castro hesitated, wondering why they spoke in such unusual, lofty speech. Their language wasn't like that of the rockheads Castro, Cuddy, and Bath encountered at Liberty Island. "'My name is Castro,' said the general. Piker pushed his way between Castro and the guards. He's a straggler, neither Rockhead nor Morlock. He must be Canadian, one of the men said, matter-of-factly. The general laughed. <laughs> no, I assure you, I'm not Canadian. He sized the men up. He was sure he could overcome them if he had to. But how many more of them were there? Time is important, Castro said. I seek, uh, an audience with your magistrate. Piker leaned in, whispering to the sentries. He says he's healed. You be healed, Castro? Asked the man on the general's right. Castro shrugged. It would make no difference if I had a weapon or not. The two of you look so sickly you may as well fall over. Piker snickered. The guards glanced at each other, but the conviction, the determination in their eyes remained. You presume much, said the guard on the left. This is absurd, Castro glared at them. Look, are you going to let me through or not? Piker craned in close, too close to the general. Tell them you has treasure. Cuckoos are easily swayed by purdy things. Fine, Castro sighed deeply, his robotic voice distorting audibly. I bring your magistrate treasure. It is well that you do, Canuck, said the first guard. Castro started to protest. He stood his ground. His Holiness longs for treasures from the world, said the second guard. Great, Castro said sarcastically. I'll give His Holiness treasure. Now can I please go through? The two men stood aside, knotty spears raised overhead. Make your way to the altar, Castro, but be warned. Only the pure of heart may look on the magistrate, lest they should turn to. Before the man finished, Piker danced gleefully. They go insane, mad, crazy. Full-sized hands waved like nervous tendrils at his shoulders. Castro walked through the gate cautiously. He turned back as the wrought iron closed behind them. I'm sure they do, he muttered under his breath and turned his attention back to the great house before him. Aftermath, a fire pit creative group production Based on a story created by Rhett Davis, with characters created by Rhett Davis, Warren Davis, Willem de Grief, and Cole Hoopengarner. Original script by Warren Davis, with Cole Hoopengarner. Narrated and produced by Cole Hoopengarner, with music by Warren Davis. Links to the sound effects used for Aftermath can be found in the description section of each episode. Aftermath and its story and characters are copyright 2019 by Fire Pit Creative Group.